We are, uh, we're going to pick back up now with how you replace the culture of poverty and violence with uh, a culture of prosperity and, and safety. And uh, working our way through the, the five pillars that are at the heart of American civilization, we're on pillar three, which is entrepreneurial free enterprise. And again, if you think about everything we talked about when we spent two hours on entrepreneurial free enterprise, it won't surprise you that almost by definition, a decentralized entrepreneurial system will be inherently more effective than a centralized government bureaucracy. Now, on the surface, people will read that and they'll say, well, yeah, we know that's true. That if you have lots of small units, each operating on their own, if they have entrepreneurial incentives and if they have entrepreneurial leaders who are out there trying to get the job done, it will do better than a large bureaucratic structure managed by nine to five bureaucrats. People say, yeah, that's true. And then you say, okay, so what are we going to do now? And the answer is, well, build a bigger bureaucracy. And there is a huge, it's called cognitive dissonance. There, there's, a, there's a breakdown where everything says we ought to go over and do this, but we find ourselves going over here. And so it's a major problem in how do you break down. And it's very, I find it, if it weren't so tragic, and if it wasn't costing human beings their lives, and if it wasn't allowing people literally to be betrayed and left behind unnecessarily, I think it would be hysterically funny. Now, the example I'm going to give you is one we've talked about for two years. It absolutely works. We all know it works. It actually changes people's lives. It actually saves the taxpayer money. And it is almost impossible to get the government to be willing to use it because it eliminates one of the government's functions. And this is a private sector entrepreneurial model of helping the poor developed by two former social workers who decided that the, that the social work system they were engaged in was doomed to fail and they wanted to design a model to actually transform people. This is not a theory. This is a real program. It's in New York. It's called America Works. Uh, and I want you to take a couple minutes and just take a look at America Works. Peter Cove is a veteran of urban poverty programs. His wife, Lee Bowes, is a sociologist with 15 years' experience working with welfare mothers. They have created a successful business putting people on welfare to work. For Stephanie Bradley, it meant a job in a big ad agency. So that's taken care of. For Evelyn Santiago, her first job ever, and she's been there for a year. We become the network, or the old girls' network, for people who don't have access in. Their company is called America Works. It operates in New York and Connecticut. I work with a no-fee staffing service in the city. We provide employees... Uh, it's essentially a job placement company, but they're placing people most employment agencies wouldn't touch. More popularly called welfare. But because they have a lot of... The women who come here average five or six years on welfare. This woman has been on for 14 years. Okay, if you don't get the first job, that's fine. They're placed in jobs where they're on probation for four months. The key here is to sound responsible. And About a third of them don't make it, too unmotivated or too disorganized to make the adjustment. But for those who do make it, the success is real. Keep on going. Keep your eyes on the prize. America Works places about 1,000 people a year in jobs, real jobs. A New York State survey found that 85% of them were still working a year after they started. Main reasons why people lose their jobs in this type of placement process is because they have not handled their childcare. For those who have never worked, this is a kind of dress rehearsal for the real world. Um, I am a mother of eight children. I'm 33 years old. I went to school to the sixth grade, but now I see that school is very important because I am a person that has very low self-esteem for the simple fact that I can't read too good. For many, the support of others who are in the same boat is what pulls them through. Once they get jobs, they get a more practical kind of help. If you've got a sick child, we'll go and pick the child up. If you're having a problem with your daycare provider, we'll find you a new one. If you need a new apartment, we'll find you a new apartment. We'll do these things in the evenings and on the weekends so you can stay working. That is what reception is definitely speaking. Working at jobs that average $14,000 a year plus benefits. I have a gentleman named Chip. And they're often jobs like Stephanie Bradley's, 
jobs with a future. Stephanie is a model employee. She really is setting all kinds of records. She's already been promoted twice since she's been here. But this is more than a new life for Stephanie Bradley and others like her. It's a new deal for the taxpayer. The workers are on probation for the first four months on the job. Once they land the job, and only then, the state pays America Works $5,300. Since it would cost about $23,000 a year to keep someone like Stephanie on welfare, the state saves money. For the taxpayer, this is absolutely the way government should do business. It, for the first time, government is saying to a company, ours, America Works, that we will pay you for delivery. We won't pay you for a nice program that you run that feels good to everybody. We're going to pay you if you get someone off of welfare. The taxpayer saves, America Works makes a profit, everybody wins. But most of all, a woman like Evelyn Santiago with a ninth grade education, on welfare for 17 years, most of all, she wins. It's been such a change, I feel so good and I just want to keep going. I want to do more for myself. It's good to have a bank account. I've never had a bank account, and now I have a little bit. I have my own. That's mine. And I can say it's mine. It feels good. I can go to the stores if I want to. I feel I can do anything now. I'm moving on, and I can continue to move. Notice uh, the uh, emphasis of freedom. She has her bank account, even if it's not much, it's hers. Notice the emphasis on employment. Notice the emphasis on discernment. You've got to go in there, that you go through a training program with them. You don't make it through the training program, they don't try to place you. Uh, notice the bonding. We will help you find a place for your child. We'll help you uh, find a better apartment. We'll work with you. A lot of things that work there. Uh, notice also it's a model that not only could be applied across the country to work, but what about addiction? What if we said to addiction programs, we'll pay you based on uh, how many are still free a year later? We won't pay for effort. We'll pay for achievement. The whole model, what if you said that to schools? I had recently suggested that uh, all the remedial work in college ought to be charged to the public school system that failed to do it. I mean, why aren't we paying on achievement? We uh, provide some incentive for the government to become effective, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm suggesting that incentive. In fact, it's a very simple phrase to go back to something you'd asked about earlier. I'm suggesting that incentives work. And, and uh, we think that incentives, in fact, but there are incentives at every level. The, and again, you've got to think this through. This is why it is a cultural change, okay? The people who found America works, if they can franchise and they can grow, and if they put 10,000 people a year at work instead of 1,000, guess what's going to happen to the two founders? They're going to be rich. Which means, of course, they'll be inappropriate. 